Are you going through hard times in your marriage right now? Are you on the brink of destruction? Maybe for some of you, you want to throw in the towel, call it quits, just give up because you're looking at your day to day and saying, you know what? The future's bleak. I don't see beyond today. I don't see how any of this can turn around. And so for some of you, you're considering divorce. For some of you, you're considering a separation. Well, today I want to talk to you about can splitting up save your marriage? We live in a society today when something is broke, rather than fixing it, you replace it with something brand new. We treat our cars that way. We treat our appliances that way. We treat pretty much everything that way, even including our spouses. And so when we come across hard times and when we feel as if there's no hope for the future, we think that the best thing to do is just to count our chips, you know, cut the loss, move forward, start a new life. And I want to let you know that it doesn't have to be that way. And so if you're considering divorce or considering a separation, let me introduce a concept to you that maybe you haven't heard before. It's called a controlled separation. Now, typically when you hear the word separation, separation is one step closer to divorce. It's just the process that we have to go through before we completely end it. And depending upon the state that you live in, there are different requirements in terms of the, le the legalities of what you can and cannot do that will allow you to divorce. Um, but I want to introduce something called a controlled separation or a trial separation that has a different purpose. In essence, while separations are used to lead to divorce, a controlled separation is simply for the purpose of taking a break, figuring some things out and then determining if we can come together in a much better place to continue on with the marriage. Think about when you're in a relationship. You've heard the difference between a breakup and taking a break, right? Well, we're just taking a break right now uh, because we just need to assess some things. We need to clear our minds. We need to, to get on the same page so that we can then come back. It's not an official breakup. It's not the complete termination of the relationship. It's just pushing pause to reevaluate. Well, a controlled separation is the same way. And many people do it because there's so much conflict, there's so much hostility in the home, it is just not a safe environment right now. There's a negative mood and tone and atmosphere in the household and each other's presence is so triggering that it's just not a good place to be in. Maybe every conversation becomes an argument and there's constant conflict, there's an emotional roller coaster. Uh, and so therefore, why don't we just take a pause, think through some things and then come back together. And so it gives people an opportunity to clear their mind. And so what I wanna do today is give you some guidelines of what a, an effective controlled separation looks like. So here are the 12 guidelines for successful controlled separation. Number one, set a time limit. Well, how long should we be separated anyway? How long is too long and how much time is not enough? Great question. It is generally recommended that if you're gonna do a controlled separation, knowing that the purpose is to become the best version of yourself so that you can have the best relationship together that you can ever have, then two to six months is what is considered standard. And there's a lot that goes into that timeline. Finances is an issue, children are an issue, and just what you two as a couple agree is enough time to really dig in deep uh, to make this effective. And so two to six months, generally speaking, 60 to 90 days is the window that I like to stay in when I'm working with couples because it's just enough time to really feel it, okay? Guideline number two, you must come to an agreement on dating outside the relationship. I would say that emphatically the answer should be no. There is no dating anyone else. See, what happens is, well, we're separated now. We're not in a committed relationship. We're not in the same home. I've got my freedom. I've got my time. I can do whatever I want. I can date this person. I can have sex with that person. And what you're doing is confusing the situation and going from bad to worse. If you're really evaluating is this a relationship worth restoring? You can't bring another individual into your world because that further confuses things. Because that new, think about it, new is sexy. 
So um, if I meet somebody new, I'm looking at all of the wonderful things about this person because we have a tendency of putting our best foot forward. So we're only going to show the best of who we are in that dating season. And so as I see this other person's great qualities, it's going to remind me of all the things that I don't like about my spouse. And then it further confuses things. Now I'm stuck. Do I a search for the new or do I stick with an old that doesn't make me happy in the first place? And then when you bring sex into the equation, as we know, sex is not just sex. Uh, you're bringing your heart, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your everything into that experience. And once you become sexually and emotionally entangled in another person, it creates even more of an emotional disconnect. You're already geographically disconnected, but an emotional disconnect from your spouse. So I would think that as a rule, there should be an upfront agreement that neither of you will entertain members of the opposite sex. And just for clarity, we're talking about engaging in sex. We're talking about dating. We're even talking about friends. See, we can justify, well, it's, he's just a friend. You know, she's just somebody that I talk to. Well, there's been an evolution of infidelity. And typically speaking, most affairs aren't typically transactional. They are relational. So they start off as platonic and then transition into something that is what we would call inappropriate because feelings and thoughts and all types of things begin to be expressed and then you realize that there are commonalities and you begin to like what you see and like the connection and so it completely confuses things so you should not be contacting old partners you should not be contacting potential partners you should not be entertaining new relationships really this is a time to self-isolate to contain to be alone by yourself in essence <clears throat> There are three relationships that we have, right? We have our vertical relationship with God. We have our internal relationship with ourselves. And then we have our horizontal relationship with our spouse, with our children, with our family, with our friends. This is the time to really take the time to properly maintain, develop, and master the internal relationship and the vertical relationship. And if you're taking advantage of that time, you don't have time to entertain anything else or anyone else. Hope that makes sense. Um, guideline number three, no attorneys. Listen, you are not pursuing a divorce. So therefore, you don't need an attorney uh, or having consultations with an attorney to determine what's within your legal right. How do you protect yourself? We're not talking about divorce. We're talking about splitting up to save the marriage. And depending upon who you speak to, whether it's legal advice, financial advice, just overall general advice, they can wind up talking you out of uh, the agreement that you've established with your partner. So this is not a time to be engaging with attorneys. Guideline number four, determine who moves out. Now, in most cases, generally it's the man who moves out, okay? So I wanna talk to you about moving outside of the home versus moving outside of the bedroom. See, number one, there is a separation when you leave the home. So whether you're going to a family member's house, a friend's house, whether you're staying in a hotel, an Airbnb, really your financial uh, stability will then determine what the best course of action is. While some can, can financially make the investment in having two different places, think about it. If we're, if we're separated for two months, three months, upwards of six months, I may need a temporary residence that will have a cost associated with it. And so if we have the financial means to do that, uh, we, we, you know, that's what we'll do. But if we don't, okay, and, and I can't be on my friend's couch for a number of months, some people choose to have an in-house separation because in that house, maybe one person stays in the bedroom, the other person's in the basement, you're separated, okay? And so you're giving each other space, you're giving each other time. Now, even though you're not physically there, your presence, in essence, is still there. And there are things that you could talk about in order to create space where you don't feel your partner's presence in a healthy way so that you can go about your business doing what you uh, are here to do. So determining who moves out and where he or she will go is critically important. Guideline number five, discuss finances. As just mentioned, there's a financial cost and burden with separating. It's not as expensive as a divorce, 
not just in the divorce proceedings, but the long-term financial implication of what a divorce will bring, there is a strain financially on a couple when they separate. So talking about the finances, who's gonna continue to manage uh, the household bills, who's responsible for what, these are questions that still need to be you know, addressed and discussed and resolved. See, you can conclude a conversation without bringing resolution to that conversation. So financial resolution is critically important if this thing is going to go well. Guideline number six, do not interrupt the welfare of the children. Understand that when a couple is in crisis, the children are impacted. I don't care if they're infants and consciously don't know what's going on. I don't care if they are elementary age, middle school, high school, if they're living in that household, they are impacted by what happens. And so here's the reality. A lot of people say, you know what? I'm not feeling my spouse right now, uh, but I'm gonna be the best, the best mother I can be, or I'm gonna be the best father I can be. And I think that's great. And I think that when we say that, we really lean into that and we mean well. Uh, but this is what I will say. Your children will feel your individual love. It will go vertically from you down to your children. So they'll feel the love from mom and dad. But if they don't feel like there's a connection between you two, they may not feel as if they exist in a loving environment. And that keeps them from feeling safe and secure. And depending upon the age of those children, a lot of times they will take on and internalize a lot that's going on amongst their parents. And sometimes they even take responsibility for what's going on uh, with their parents. And it's a very confusing time and the future looks bleak for them. And so you two as individuals have to do a good job co-parenting with one another to make sure that those children are taken care of. You know, as I've always said, the best gift that you can give your child is the relationship that you have with your spouse. See, because children learn through observation and participation. So when they are in a loving environment and can see the love between mom and dad, they feel loved. They feel safe. So during your separation, you definitely want to uh, take the time to spend time as a family. You know, rather than breaking up the routine of, well, on Saturdays, the family comes together to pour into the children. I don't think that that should be interrupted. You may have to explain why mommy and daddy are in different rooms or why mommy and daddy you know, are in different locations, but you need to let them know that what's going on between them has, has should not have too much of an impact on what's going on in terms of how you engage with those children. So whatever those traditions are, whatever those rituals are, we would encourage you to either maintain them or create them to create a sense of safety with the children. Guideline number seven, keep it confidential. Listen, you don't have to share everything with everybody because number one, not everyone means you well or your relationship well. Not everyone will have the same opinion or approach as you. Not everyone will understand your methodology or why you're doing what you're doing. You know, oftentimes our closest ones, family, friends, associates, they love us and they want the best for us. And they may be friends to us individually, but they may not be friends of the marriage. So you have to be really careful who you listen to. A lot of times we have a tendency of sharing our problems with people who share our problems. And so why would you take advice from someone going through a, a similar thing? Or why would you take advice um, from someone who's not doing well in their relationship and has a track record of not? And so you have to be really careful who you open up to. You know, I do believe that there should be a core group of people that you do share with because they represent individuals who mean you well. They can be marriage mentors. They can be very close family friends who are neutral and are biased to you and will give you good wisdom and good advice because they are friends of your marriage. Do you understand the difference? So really be careful who you share it with. Um, not everyone needs to know because if you're in a bad place and you begin to reveal and pour out and share with these individuals the pain that you're going through, even if you get to a place where you begin to resolve these issues with your partner and you come back together, you're in a better place. Well, guess what? Your friend or your family member, they didn't go through that process. So they're still holding on to your pain. They're still holding on to your hurt. 
They're still holding on to your perspective at the time that you shared it. And you've moved on and moved past it, but they are still stuck. And so now it creates all types of issues and it's very uncomfortable dealing with this community of people because they knew too much and did not walk through a similar process of restoration that you walked through. Guideline number eight, seek a good therapist, counselor, or coach. Remember, you don't want to tell everyone, but you do want to tell someone, someone that can guide you through a process. Someone who has walked through controlled separations, have walked through dealing with couples who are in crisis, have walked through people who are on the verge of divorce because they may have the tools. You know, I constantly say, listen, you don't want to just rely upon yourself. Here's this analogy. If you've ever been on a plane before, when a plane lifts off of the ground, I don't care where it's going. It can be going from Atlanta to Los Angeles. When that plane lifts off of the ground, 90% of its journey is off course. The only way that it gets to its final destination, there's a radar system in the cockpit guiding that plane. So the longitude, latitude lines, the coordinates, all of those things are constantly being course corrected and adjusted in order to stay on track, to stay on the journey, to get to the final destination. So there was a system in place. There was a radar system in place. Well, guess what? Couples who attempt to restore their relationship on their own, 90% of their journey is going to be off course. And you will wind up in a place that you may not have anticipated. So sometimes it takes a system, a radar system, a guide to take you through a process to get you to your final destination and that's a restored relationship. And so this is a time not to be on the fence as to whether it's worthwhile to get help. This is the time when you really need it the most. And so if that's you, we encourage you, call Couples Academy, set up a free discovery call. Let's see how we can help you navigate through this process. Guideline number nine, commit to personal growth and self-development. At the end of the day, you are the lowest common denominator in every relationship you enter into. And I know you're separated right now and I know that you're in, under stress and in crisis because of your partner, right? It's your partner's fault. But you have to realize that when you point the finger at your partner, there are three fingers pointing right back at you. And so it's a two-way street. Yes, there are things that your partner has done that has gotten you to this place. But there are also issues that you brought into the relationship or were created within that relationship that have also created negative patterns, which has ultimately created a vulnerability in the relationship. So while you're alone, maybe you're the betrayed spouse, maybe you're the unfaithful spouse, whatever side of this process you are on, you need your own personal healing. You need a process uh, to overcome the issues and the pain and the hurts that you've been dealing with. Uh, and so working with a counselor, therapist, or coach individually, as well as getting a good book on, on self-development, going through some system on self-development, it will help you to become a better you. Because when you become a better you, you begin thinking different, you begin making different decisions, you begin operating from a healthier place, that gives you the foundation of a long lasting, mutually beneficial, sustained relationship. Guideline number 10, spend time together. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were separated for two to six months. Well, you are. But if you're separated for two to six months and there are no touch points where you two come together, some, you know, one of you will say, you know what? I'm good. This vacation has been good. I'm out and it can lead to a further disconnect and a justification to move towards divorce. Meanwhile, the other person who's wired to want to connect is going through hell. It is a torturous experience because there's no phone calls, there's no text messages, there's no point of contact. I don't know what's going on. It's been six weeks. I'm full of fear and anxiety. And, I, and so to avoid that on either side, it is critically important that you come together regularly. Now, what does that look like? There are two days that every couple should come together on weekly. Your work day, your play day. See, if you're going to a therapist to uh, impact your relationship, if you're working on yourself individually, you've got to have a touch point where you test things out, where you talk things out, where you walk things out. 
and they're small incremental steps forward to get you to a place where then you can fully engage with one another. And so if we have 160 hours in a week, all I'm requesting is that you spend two hours of that 168 connecting with one another. On your work day is the day that you work on the relationship. So you're talking about, you know, what the counselor said in that session. Maybe you're working on a document or a form or there's some assignment that you are called to do. And it's helping to gain more clarity and give you more closure and help you to communicate through issues that previously you couldn't because you were in a very high of, you know, volatile state then your play day is the day where you just connect. It's not about work. It's not about digging in and, 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 and discussing hard issues, but just being light, being casual, being free. You know, kind of reminding yourself of what things were like when things were good. Reminding yourself of why you two connected in the first place. And that process of going from a work day to a play day, from a work day to a play day, you're creating momentum. And that momentum is moving you forward in a positive direction where you become hopeful. And now you begin to believe maybe there is a future. Maybe there is a path for us that is long lasting, sustainable and mutually beneficial. And so those two days are critically important. So in addition to the time where you come together virtually, you know, for your session, uh, the, those times where you come together to have your work day and your play day, it should be just enough time uh, for it to be impactful, but not long enough where now we don't even feel like we're separated because we're always together. So you don't want to do that. You want to feel this separation. You want to feel it. It shouldn't just feel like we're just sleeping in two different beds in two different places, but everything else is normal. There should not be a sense of normalcy. It should be uncomfortable. It should be, you know, like, wow, this is this is wearing on me. It's been a couple months and man, I'm feeling this. That's what you want. That's the whole purpose of this. Guideline number 11, discuss the rules surrounding sex. Now listen, you're separated, but you're still married. And in this marriage, you know what? We have needs, sexual needs, sexual needs that need to be fulfilled. And so the thought of being separated for two to six months and I can't touch my spouse, I can't gratify myself sexually with my partner, that's a hard pill to swallow. But here's the reality, in most cases, generally speaking, when couples are in crisis, they're not having sex anyway. They're just not. One of the first things that's impacted when a couple is going through issues is their sex life. Many people are engaged in sexless marriages and a sexless marriage is a, is a couple who has sex anywhere between one time a month, upwards of 10 times a year. And there are many couples who have gone literally months and years with no sex. And so during the separation, that's not the time to get deeper involved in sex because sex can actually confuse things. Sex can make you think, well, everything's all right now. So you have to understand that sex is chemistry. And so when you engage in sex, it's more than just a physical interaction. There are emotions and there are uh, chemicals that are being released that make you feel good, that make you feel in love. And all of these things can happen and it can really cloud what's really going on. For instance, when I'm working with couples, a lot of times when couples start feeling good, they stop the process. And their philosophy is, well, we're good now. Uh, I don't think we need to continue assigning, we're good. And I'm like, I don't know about that. We're still building a foundation. Just because you are feeling better about yourself and better about each other, doesn't mean that you have a long lasting foundation that is sustainable for your success. Let's continue to go through the process, and we do. But likewise, during a separation, if everything is normal, and you're getting sex when you want, and you're coming together when you want, and you're doing, and you're dating when you want, then what is the purpose of the separation, right? So during this period of time, you want to be completely detached so that you can become attached to self, to God, and to a vision of what your future looks like. So it is uh, recommended that you have no sex with each other, that you have no sex with others, and that you have no sex with yourself. And finally, guideline number 12, come back together. At the end of that two to three to upwards of six month separation process, 
if you've gone through the proper steps, you're committed to a, 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 a plan of personal growth and self-development, you're working with a coach, a therapist, or a counselor, you're having these touch points, your work day, your play day, you're spending time with your kids. And so if you're spending enough time in prayer and you're doing all the necessary things to really restore you as a person, you are now ready to come back together in a completely different environment with a completely different flow that works for your relationship. Now, Danielle and I did a video where we talked about the three post-affair marital patterns. We talked about the sufferers, the builders, and the explorers. If you haven't watched that video, just know that that video will be available uh, in the description below for you to click on and watch. It's really important, but uh, what you're doing is you're going through a process to become an explorer, creating a brand new relationship for yourself. None of you want to sign up for the relationship that you've had. That's why you were on the verge of divorce in the first place. You don't want to recommit to the same old person and the same old patterns and the same old ways of doing things. You want something completely new and taking on an explorer mentality allows you to do that. And so if you've gone through these 12 steps, you're in a better position to have the relationship that you ultimately want.